thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony FrischConnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony FrischConnect. Hey everyone, this is Tony FrischConnect. Welcome to Plant Problems. Hope you guys are doing great out there today. I know everybody is starting to get back into a little bit of flow of their lives. And just so we don't date the podcast too well, it seems like the economy is moving forward after pandemic issues. At least I'm hoping the best for it, but I know a lot of you out there, it may have not even affected. So what I wanted to start off today just by kind of going back into my role into becoming an entrepreneur and where I got started. You know, I started really young working. I grew up and my father was a carpenter. I grew up working with my hands, building stuff in the shop, just playing around the shop, partially probably because we didn't have a babysitter. The other, you know, he put me to work on stuff and I was free labor. So I got to learn a lot of stuff there. But I did notice something. I noticed he didn't have a boss. So that was pretty normal to me. There's a lot of people out there, their parents had always worked for another company. So it would be pretty foreign for them to see their parents not going to a normal nine to five job. And as we're getting into this information era that has been happening for quite some time now, the normal job isn't, it's not normal anymore. There's a lot of people working from home, such as myself. But as I was growing up into my early 20s, I did like a lot of people do. I had a boss. I worked for other companies. I was in a restaurant manager at a Qdoba back in my early 20s. I worked inside sales at Sears and Home Depot while I had my side hustle. And everybody refers to those nowadays as a side hustle, something that's kind of hopefully going to turn into my full-time job. My side hustle at a time was doing and creating real estate opportunities when I was doing fix and flip. So again, using my hands to build those, but I had to have something to kind of put food on the table or in your 20s just so I could pay rent. And that's what I started with. And I know all of you out there have your own story or what's great is you're probably in the middle of creating that story where you are now and where you want to be. And I still feel that way. I still feel that I have a lot of that. And today I'm going to bring a couple guys that I think are doing some incredible stuff. But these guys, we're going to look at two from two different sides. One of them is kind of starting his career as an entrepreneur in the making. And one of them has already been there. So it's a father and son duo. I want to start with sharing that, you know, these guys are working on backup editing back up to the start area where I say start. I want to share with you that these guys have been through and one is going through right now, these ups of the startup and the downs of the startup. So we'll get into that. And I hope this gives you guys a feeling that, hey, maybe I'm in one of these spots. Maybe I'm in the beginning. Maybe I'm in the middle. Heck, maybe I already saw some success and I'm looking for that next idea or that next thing to put my investment into. So today I've got uh, David Ross. David, I've known for quite some time. He's a bit younger, so we have a little bit of a generation between us, but he's been passionate about this industry for a long time. He actually came on board and worked and developed some really cool products with us with Open Vape. He worked really hard on the vape cartridges. So he took a lot of that knowledge and created some other products with Sparks Distributors. He's also working on products with growth leasing right now. And he's also doing some business consulting from his cannabis knowledge with growth leasing. He started a consulting group with his father, Gary Ross, which he's going to be the other gentleman I'm going to talk about here in a minute. So they've been doing that for a few years. And he's also currently the co-founder and product developer at Essential Extractions. So we're going to get a little bit in his insight today. And the next gentleman, as I mentioned before, Gary Ross. 
Uh, Gary is a very interesting individual. He has a lot of experience, not only executive experience, but entrepreneurial experience. He got his start a long time ago back with that old company. Some of you may remember HP or Hewlett Packard and went on to manage and work in many executive roles with the company, with Hewlett Packard. Not only Hewlett Packard, but Comlinear Corporation, National Semiconductor. So he's got 30 years of experience in high performance and analog mixed signal semiconductor industry and device production. That's a lot to say, I know. But he's been involved in that world for quite some time. Back in 2010, when I was building up in the dispensary world, I actually brought Gary in to meet some of my business partners to help us work through some issues we were having at the time. So that was his first little experience in cannabis, but now look back, that's 10 years ago. So we actually introduced him to my other business partners in Open Vape in 2013 when we founded it, and he became the CEO there. After that, 2014, he was ranked in the top 25 most influential people in the cannabis industry, which is pretty awesome that it only took him a year before he was in that area of expertise. He comes with extreme amount of influence in building teams. That's what he's really good at. And that's also come with a lot of experiences being vice president at Fairchild Semiconductors. He was also president and CEO at Gadeca Microcircuits. I mean, the list goes on and on. I know this is a long buildup, but I want to share that the experience that is involved in other industries is starting to bleed into cannabis. And I think it's very good because for one, it's opening up the eyes of people that have kind of had this close. Hey everyone, Tony Frisch Connect here with Plant Problems. I want to thank you guys for listening in your why do this show. And I also want to thank you for leaving me a review, taking your precious 15 seconds of your time and spending it with me and sharing me what I do well and what I can improve on. So please go to plantproblem.com and leave those questions, comments, or reviews. All right, back to the show. Feel to the outside business world. That's not happening. I mean, it's been happening for a couple of years, but if you haven't seen it, even seeing more as these new states open up. The last few years, he's been working with David, and they've also done a lot of business consulting with other cannabis companies, as I mentioned before. But also, they have recently founded a new extraction company called Essential Extractions. So they're going to share with you some of the exciting stuff that they're building and working on in there today. And let's just go into it. I want to make sure that these guys have enough time to really give you their insight. They've got some really cool insight. If you guys are tuning into some China stuff, I think this will help you at least give you a good direction. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Gary and David Ross. Gary Ross, David, how are you gentlemen doing today? Doing well, thank you. I've got David here. We pulled him out. He's hanging out in the lab talking to us today. And Gary's come calling or talking to us from his own office. Gary, China, there's some crazy things going on right now with, of course, the coronavirus. But I want to talk to you today because of your experience, you and David's experience developing products in China. There are some very big lessons I know you've learned over your last 30 years creating products. And Gary's big focus when he was over in China for probably once a month for 20 years was in the semiconductor industry. Gary, what brought you over there? Like, was HP, they sent you over there and they said, or who was the company you were working with at the time? Well, you know, I tell you, so currently I am a CEO of Essential Extractions Corporation. And what we did is in the early days, let me take you back to the semiconductor days, prior to realizing what the benefits were with China, we were struggling with doing what was called semiconductors, which was cost down. And so some of my background is supply chain manager and then eventually becoming a CEO of two startups in the semiconductor industry that successfully transitioned into two Fortune 500 companies. We actually merged into two companies, two different companies over the course of 30 years. During that time, we established a lot of cost down measures initially within China. 
China, it's all about the relationships. It's not so much about the contract, it's about the relationship. In the U.S., we focus on having the contract first, and then we do business, right? And then we become friends. In China, it's all about being friends first, get the association established, and then do a contract and then business on going. So long-term relationships in China are extremely important. So the initial days, 30 years ago, it was all about cross-down factor. One thing that we realized during the course of development is just how sharp they can be when it comes down to operation science. So they're operational experts. And after that, they have become really production-oriented, creating machines and so within their organizations. And so working with them, taking our knowledge and our design and our concepts, we were able to work with them to establish large volume manufacturing at a very low cost. But there was always challenges related to quality and quality performance when we initially started. But through the course of time, with some of the teachings from people like Deming, with a statistical process control, we were able to change their mindset and their environment, basically, on how to create really solid products. So through the course of those that period of time, we established long-term relationships with manufacturers that we knew that produce high-quality product, irregardless of what the industry was. So those relationships that were established years ago, so it's kind of like pyramid effect. So you have many, many different manufacturers in China. And then all of a sudden, you weed those down to the ones that you know that can actually produce a high-quality product at the cost that you want. And so that's what we have done, is we've taken our semiconductor, high-volume, low-cost manufacturing, you know, very perfect product, placed it in China. Now we're taking that knowledge, taking that knowledge, and we're using it in silvery-based products that are being designed for the cannabis industry. So what we have done is we've narrowed down the focus to just one particular company that we feel comfortable with using GMP practices, GMP ISO 5 standard practice to be able to produce products that we feel are medical grade. And then we do the final assembly in the United States through the final quality assurance. That way we maintain control of the design and we maintain control of the final quality product. So that's what we're doing on a component level. On the extraction material machines, we actually build those from the bottom up here in the U.S. based on our manufacturing knowledge here. So in China, when you are going to find a GM, GMP certified manufacturer, is that common over in China? No, it's not. It really isn't. There's a lot of them that will flag themselves as being GMP certified, but they actually have to go through the right process to be able to become GMP certified. GMP is an offshoot of what we call the FDA. And we all know the FDA in the United States is, has very strict rules. And so there's very few companies in China that have actually been certified and registered to GMP standards that the FDA recognizes. So the Chinese, they're aware of this. So the active companies that are really wanting to be in the mainstream of the U.S., they're adapting? Is that what they're doing? Or they know there's a need for it? I think they're beginning to understand there is a need for it. That wasn't something that was widely acknowledged as being important just a few years ago. And now it's becoming more and more prevalent. For example, vape cartridges. When we first entered the industry several years ago, vape cartridges, I was absolutely appalled to see how vape cartridges being manufactured, all of them being manufactured in China, they were following the eSig rule of standard, the eSig. And the eSig rule of standard was make it cheap and make it dirty, fast as possible. So just like cigarettes in general, right? They just it didn't matter. <laughs> So touring some of the manufacturing facilities, I said, oh my gosh, this is nuts. And so I went to this longtime manufacturing partner that I've used in the semiconductor industry that also made medical devices for us. I went to him and I said, gosh, there's a great opportunity for somebody to do this right, to make a high quality product 
And lo and behold, he decided to build an entire manufacturing facility based on outline. So David and I worked really closely with them, and they designed an entire facility that's clean room environments, class 100 clean room environment. What does class 100 mean? Well, class 100 is the number of uh, particles per billion, right? Okay. And what happens is the amount of filtration that takes place to reduce the number of particulates in the air per meter. And so the lower that number, the better. So you can imagine when you're in your house right now, you're probably at a class in a clean house. (laughs) It's an old one, but yeah, hopefully it's clean enough. (laughs) So I'm looking around here and seeing some dandruffs, maybe at a class 15,000, right? Okay. That's not bad. There's a lot worse. But there is a clean rooms that can be registered as clean rooms where you do microcircuit hybrid assembly, and those could be class 1,000, and that's acceptable. So when you're doing subparticle semiconductor measurements, submicron, then you want to be at class 10. That's about as clean as you can get, class 10. So all of a sudden, we've got a manufacturing facility in China that's taking care of these, what we call medical grade products, because people are actually inhaling and putting these products to their mouth at class 100. So that's even better than some of the microcircuit assembly houses. So we were really proud of getting that accomplished with this company in China. So we've got a lot of video that shows the assembly and the very last aspiration process is what we call deionization. Okay. What's deionization? What does that do? So DI water actually is a medical grade way of cleaning anything that's metal, basically anything. It's just a sterilization process that's next to none. So after deionization, those components need to be packaged and protected. David actually had a lot to do with designing a lot of these products, correct, David? Yes, absolutely. I was in charge of taking a concept all the way through design, through development, and successfully launched several products. Like cartridge, you were doing a lot of cartridge designs, and you were also having, from what I remember when we talked, is you were doing a lot of the communication back and forth with China. Tell me a little more about that, because that's pretty interesting. I didn't realize how much goes into just the fact that they're on the other side of the planet. Having to manage that has to be overwhelming, right? A lot of nights, working nights, (laughs) that's for sure. And yeah, just staying in constant communication with engineers, the designers, as well as the sales guys on really lining up what is feasible from a manufacturing standpoint and a sales standpoint, looking at what was acceptable in the marketplace, realizing that uh, there's a big movement going towards C-cell, what's called C-cell, kind of like Kleenex, right? But it's a ceramic core that was sought after in the marketplace. And so we're at the forefront of that. and We're able to capture that and take that concept and come out with several designs of cartridges with that C-cell technology over in China, which obviously today, that was back a few years ago. Today, I mean, that's all, all you have to see is, is uh, C-cell cartridges for distillates and, and live resin concentrates and things like that. Do you think the manufacturers there are really in tune with what the market here is in the U.S.? Or I remember back when I was involved with my vape company and we were dealing with a lot of different problems with the cartridges. Do you see, are those getting better now? Are they about the same? Is it been, still depend on the manufacturer? It definitely depends on the manufacturers and who you want to work with. We've been able to kind of bridge that gap with our supply chain really giving our manufacturers, the engineers, the data they need, the feedback that very frequently get to build a better product. The reason why I have you guys on today, for the listeners out there, these guys are developing some products over here in the U.S., and we'll share those with you real shortly, but there's been some pivotal points in the industry that both of these gentlemen have taken place and David's been involved for the last 10 years. Gary's been involved for the last seven. So these guys are truly on the ground floor understanding what the market is looking for at a time. And there is very few people out there that I've seen with the experience in the manufacturing side of this. 
So when you translate that over here to the U.S., what difficulties do you have maybe that you didn't have in China or the new ones that are coming up? Good question, Tony. First, let me go back because I tell you what, I think what David was alluding to is really, really important. And this is an example of what we have accomplished and we're going. So when we talk about C-cell, C-cell cartridges, years ago, we were the pioneers of that. It was actually our idea. And so it was based on a technology from this micro circuits semiconductor industry. It was called co-fired ceramic, where you're taking conductor material and you're co-firing it with ceramic at the same time to where you end up with a basic wickless, no wick at all in the cartridge. One of the things in my early goings when we examined manufacturing for electronic cigarettes, e-cigs, is that the wicks were made out of anything that was available and it was not healthy. So we said, we got to go wickless. We got to figure out a way to do that. And so we thought back on our previous knowledge from a different industry, and it was called co-fired ceramic. And there's different conductor materials that can be fired at the same temperature as ceramic, create a wickless cell. So that's where the C-cell actually came from. And another thing why David is so successful in dealing with China is he actually speaks Mandarin. So that comes in handy. That's helpful. <laughs> that helps a little bit. You also communicate through email in Mandarin too? <laughs> you know, that is a lot easier. Oh, really? <laughs> Google Translate. <laughs> so with you being able to speak Mandarin, David, does that allow you a little bit more trust with China? Do they do they allow them to be more open? Absolutely, Tony. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've always been able to establish a really good relationship, you know, with our, with our friends over there, with my dad's friends, being introduced to them from his past life, right, from the, from the semiconductor world, and I was always able to hit it off and impress them, yeah, with non-Mandarin, they're, they're very pleased with that, and I've uh, been able to establish long-lasting relationships. So what you're telling me is that if it kind of gives you a leg up, if you can speak their language and you start talking to some of these manufacturers and scientists and R&D guys, I'm sure they take you more seriously. Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely doors that start to open up once they see that I've taken the time to learn their language. It's truly amazing. Well, it seems like, yeah, that's probably been a big part of your success. So congratulations on learning another language. Us as Americans, we tend to be, I would say, lazy. I know I'm lazy in part on second languages, so that's awesome. Good for you. As we see these challenges, so I want to go back to the new challenges that you're seeing here in the U.S. Well, go back up a second. What is the biggest challenge with working with China? Do you have, David, do you have, like, what's your top? Challenges in China are definitely communication challenges. That is just a huge barrier. Right when you think you have a good understanding and you walk away from the table, and they're off in a completely different direction. So that language barrier is definitely probably the biggest challenge. So anybody that would try to go over there and create a product should be prepared for, or even potentially having a translator to help them out. How do they take translators over there? Do they, do they like that? Do they, is that not very good? Or do they understand that? My experience is that if your translator trusts you, then the partner that you're trying to speak with will trust you as well. So manufacturers are, are kind of, most of them are in the rural, kind of outside of the Shenzhen area. Uh, not very many of them know English. And so having a translator is definitely key. Even better to have one that, that likes you, no one trusts you. So Shenzhen, I take it that's where you're doing, where you've done a lot of your work then in China. Yes, yeah. Shenzhen is the hub. So Gary, what's the most challenging part for you with all this years of experience of working with China? Well, you know, I think right now it's the level of dynamics, on, I guess more on a political scale right now, because you see the countries reaching a point of a little bit of distrust that's kind of taking place right now. And I think it's due to the current virus situation. But for the most part, the relationships are really strong amongst people that are still interacting with one another. I think, you know, I'm talking with a partner over in China, and one thing that I envisioned was going to be very important 
was the Made in USA stamp. They have that stamp. Well, in the U.S., it's not very easy for us right now to manufacture high-volume devices, components, without a lot of automation. And getting that automation right now has been very difficult to fund. The capital has not been there. Talking to my couple of partners over in China, and they're willing to take their high-volume manufacturing knowledge and some investment, place that in the U.S. if we can find the right location, and bring their knowledge on high-volume manufacturing and actually export that from China, import it into the U.S. for us to have a high-volume manufacturing with their knowledge but we have to be able to automate it to a certain point to where the labor can be cost effective. So that's the equation. So we're well on that path prior to the current situation with the economics that's associated with the worldwide dynamics with the virus. So I think that's the biggest challenge right now is to figure out how we're going to be able to continue to do business together and what makes the best economic sense for the long term for both. Well, these times there's always doubt and there's always great opportunity. It's just finding it, right? I mean, I imagine all years of entrepreneurship, you've had to do this numerous times. Oh, God, yeah. I was just reminiscing. There's, uh, you guys know Oscar Wilde, right? Yeah. And so the basis, his quote was, the basis of optimism is sheer terror. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Absolutely. I think we're on the threshold of being able to be really optimistic. And then from there, there's going to be some really cool solutions that are going to come and a lot of cool ideas. So I look at it and I think that one of the things that's fascinating to me is how people are not going to all of a sudden end up in a group again. They're going to want their isolation. They're going to want their protection. And so we believe that uh, companies and individuals will want be, to be able to do small research, small development, do small product runs, do research and development on a much smaller, separate scale, have their quality and assurance, and it's going to become a lot more individualized. I think we're seeing that before this pandemic. We saw a lot of folks wanting to put their own initials on a lot of different products in this industry. And I think that's only going to continue. I think people are going to want to have more control. They're going to want to be able to produce their own type of uh, solutions. And we have to put that in the hands of the consumer, in the hands of our partner, which is the customer, and and show them how to do that. You know what I mean? I do. So, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Because that's part of the reason why we're here today is you guys are actually developing a very small extraction machine for almost what I would say a single use type style. And so what what was the idea of bringing this to market? Why did you guys want to, uh, what, did, what did you guys see the market calling for this product? So David, and I'll let David speak too, but uh, the thing that I realized when I was uh, CEO of uh, OpenVape, as you know, Tony, they were, you were actually one of the founders there. Great team, great team, pioneering team. Pioneered the area of large scale, concentrated, very high quality, essential extraction oils, cannabis oils, and one thing that we realized during that process is to real is to is to see the opportunity for something that was much smaller in scale. And one thing that we've noticed as we've set up fabs in different states um, and consulted on those things, one thing that we've noticed is when it comes down to quality assurance and research and development, they have to run large batches huge amount of material and then they have to do the the manufacturer the producer of the oil has quality stamp so it has to be take a small sample send it out after they've invested all kinds of money in actually doing the extraction so when it comes down to research and development and quality assurance we envision that 
doing a much smaller sample, making it faster, making it less expensive, uh, would be a lot more wise and cost effective than taking a sample from a big batch and not knowing what the outcome is going to be. So you and David are, are actually very busy right now. You know, going to David, he's actually in the lab right now running uh, a batch uh, currently and doing some testing, right, David? I'm, yeah, doing it right here in, in my garage, and uh, uh, it's it's running good. And so that's that's kind of the other side of the thing. Um, you know, when you say the thing, you mean the extraction machine or the process? Kind of, yeah, the other side of the the little is doing R and D and the ability to kind of do play with it, like like I am right here in my garage, right, and just testing different materials, uh, different run times just changing the parameters um it, it's really really good r d machine uh, so you, you know what what i love about this part here is that um, for the listeners out there what david's taking and they're creating something from scratch and they are taking and they're literally doing it in the garage when you go back to folks that have developed some amazing stuff in the past let's go to even like bill gates these guys started out of their garages so you know one thing i, I want to share with you guys is that you don't have to have the laboratory you don't have to have the nicest stuff you don't to get an idea going this is a lot of the process here where these guys are trial and erring it through continuous running batches doing it out of the garage, doing it on the side when their their other job is paying their bills, they're taking their extra time and they're putting it into their garage because that's what they can afford right now and it's the best use of their time. So I like the fact that David is sharing that he's in his garage, you know, I mean, I call it a lab because basically it is a lab. He does not have a clean room setting, but he's really close. I mean, how excited are you going to be to run this in a lab in the future, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we do have systems in a few labs in New Mexico. We have a system in California and another one in Washington. Are these are your prototypes? Prototype units currently. Okay. They are capable of doing a one ounce you know, run and do about an hour uh, run just to get a good yield, but it's all automated. You just load it up, let it run, and come back, collect your extract, and do your analysis. So doing an analysis, people are using this for all kinds of different testing or for their own products or whatever, or whatever they want to make, right? And doing it in small portions. If people are interested and they want to figure out, let me back up editing. When people are interested in extraction, there's so much information online, right? There's so much stuff that comes up. How do you tell them what's right for their process? I mean, how do you share that with them? Or Gary, how would you say, hey, what do you need to look for when you're looking for an extract? It's a darn good question. So, so Tony, I tell you what. So if you take a look at this small-scale extractor, it does a lot more. One thing that we've learned, it's also very good at filtration. It's also very good for an, as an infuser, right? So with design in mind for laboratories and university applications, laboratories within universities, it's a much smaller scale type of extraction and filtration system, right? So it's a faster run time. And what we're doing is, is we're using really clean CO2. And what's applied there is just the pressure from the CO2. And it's using kinetic energy to actually process that. And so if we make it sound really simple. It's very complicated, but it's really simple to use. That's the thing. I wanted to have it to where it's just one button. You just push the darn thing one time, hit the button, and then come back in an hour later and see what you got. Now, when it comes down to the variability in starting material and whether you're starting with oil or you're starting with flour or heath, it's going to take dialing in to make it perfect. But we've got guidance to be able to teach. And also what we want to do is set up a network of users that are using the same piece of equipment to where they can share based on their experiences. So I think this is really good because I tell you what, back to the point, you know, some individuals that have very precise expectations of what they want and what they will want, basically the autonomy, 
right? They want the autonomy on the material that they have and how they want it to be consumed. Then in processing their own botanical plant, whether it's oil in oil form and they want to modify it, it's in liquid form, they want to infuse it, then we're going to have recipes to be able to do that. But the key is to put that power, that control into the hands of the individual, be it a lab or be it a person that has very high expectations on individuality. That's all great info. It's very inspiring to hear you talk about bringing something and building something in the U.S. I think these times where we're at here, control is definitely a huge factor. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And it's also kind of energizing because we're going to need some very unique ways to come out of whatever we're going to be coming out of here. And so it's going to take a lot of minds to put this together. And as Americans, we're used to digging ourselves out of holes, right? It's something that we've done over and over again. And for those of you guys listening out there, just understand the scenario for what it is. Take the best parts out of it and leave the crap behind because it is hard right now. But we're seeing guys like Gary and David and so many other people in the industry that are coming up with unique ways to solve problems. So Gary, I want to let you share, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to get in touch with you and David? You can reach us at info at essentialextractionscorp.com. So that's a little wordy, but we find it once again, it's absolutely perfect. I'd like to spend more time, you know, with your listeners and actually see some of them face to face because we do a lot better job in person. That's for Dane's show. Hey, Gary. So I just thought of this, you know, are you guys looking for investment funds as you move forward? You know, we actually are, you know, we've got up to this point, it's taken a couple of years to actually do this design. So we've been self-funded. There is an option to invest in our initial funding round. Basically, this is the initial funding round outside. So it's kind of first come, first serve. But we're looking at first $100,000 at a 50% discount. Oh, wow. That's incredible. All right. Well, so if you guys are interested in looking at some companies, essential extraction, whether you're looking at small extraction or you're looking at an investment, please reach, reach out to them at infoessentialextractioncorp.com. And Gary and David, thanks so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure and exciting to see what you can bring over from China here and develop product here. So look forward to seeing that out. For people that are listening right now, if you guys have any questions about this process, or of course you can reach out to Gary, but you can reach out to me at plantproblem.com. That's plantproblem.com. And I'd be more than happy to connect you guys with them or also try to answer whatever questions you have. So thanks so much for listening today. And I hope you guys were able to solve a couple of your problems from this. All right. Talk to you guys soon. I'm here with Gary Ross and David Ross. Just had a great interview with them. Very inspiring interview. So Gary, what did we just talk about? I tell you what, we talked about designing products in the U.S., high volume manufacturing in China, and then taking manufacturing expertise, putting that here in the United States. These were all huge things. And if you guys want to check out my next episode, please listen in to Gary and David Ross from Essential Extraction. I promise you, you'll learn something. You've just listened to another insightful episode of Plant Problems. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues. For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblems.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frischconnect. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey. 